focus three is about the second and third laws and the, their introduction of the concept of entropy. If you like, the first law deals with the quantity of energy. The second and third laws deal with the quality of energy. Um, and the starting point for the introduction of uh, the second and third laws is the, um, is the recognition that there are spontaneous changes in the world. Spontane and by spontaneous in thermodynamics, you mean changes that do not need to have work done on them in order to, for, in order to bring them about. Okay. So they're natural processes. And we know that the world is full of natural processes. Uh, chemical reactions running in one particular direction, uh, gases expanding and so on. And so the idea behind the second law is to identify the reason, or if you even like, the, the driving force for spontaneous change. And in the process, that introduces the concept of entropy. So the first topic in this particular sequence introduces entropy by trying to think about um, a, a simple natural process, a simple spontaneous process, like a bouncing ball or an expanding gas. The first thing to realise, of course, is that it is not a lowering of energy that drives something in a particular direction. We've established in the um, focus on the first law of thermodynamics that energy is conserved. There is no change in the internal energy of, a, of an isolated system. So we can't suddenly say, well, that's not quite true. It's really that systems go down to lower energy that have a natural tendency to go down to lower energy. That would be contrary to the first law. So what you've got to do is to look for another aspect of energy that um, does determine the direction of spontaneous change. And um, in the first topic, that is identified as the distribution of energy. And you can see how that works, um, um, that a hot object cooling, uh, its, its energy seeps out into the surroundings and so it becomes dispersed chaotically in the surroundings. Um, a gas expands into a, into a vacuum spontaneously, carrying its kinetic energy into the, into the, the bigger volume that um, encased the smaller one originally. And so you can begin to see that if we can identify the, um, the direction of at which energy has a tendency to disperse in chaotic disorder, then we will have identified the, um, the direction, the signpost of the direction of spontaneous change. That's all the second law is about. Um, many people say, of course, that the second law is far too sophisticated to understand. I think it's much easier to understand than the first law, because I, I certainly can understand how something can crumble and get worse, whereas I, it, it takes a much deeper way of thinking to understand why energy is conserved. So I think the second law is quite straightforward. Of course, it's quite sophisticated when you come to apply it, but that's taken care of in the way that I shall now describe. Um, you need to be able to define and measure the extent of dispersal of energy. And in other words, you need to define and measure changes in the entropy of a system. And there are two 
ways of introducing the entropy. One is the classical way, as was introduced by Clausius, by saying what you do is you simply transfer energy, and we're talking in infinitesimal terms here, we, you transfer an infinitesimal amount of energies of heat reversibly into a system, and you divide it by the temperature at which you're doing that, and that corresponds to the change of entropy. And the, uh, some people are quite puzzled by that kind of definition, but one of the um, analogies that I like to do to introduce it, and do so in this particular topic, is to say it's like sneezing. So the infinitesimal transfer of energy into the system is like sneezing, sort of random stirring up. But if you sneeze in a busy street, which corresponds to an environment with, with a high thermal temperature, with lots of, of um, chaos already present, then the additional disorder is going to be very small. Whereas if you have the, do the same sneeze in a quiet library, which corresponds to a low temperature, a thermally, a, a thermally quiet environment, then that same sneeze can produce a big change in disorder. Okay. So the, the Clausius expression for the change of entropy of a system in terms of the heat transferred reversibly divided by the temperature at which it is um, transferred uh, gives you the... Um, um, uh, uh, is, is consistent with your intuition about changes of disorder and so on. And then the, uh, the, the second way of um, introducing it is, of course, through the formula that is carved on Boltzmann's tomb in Vienna, um, which expresses it in terms of the number of ways in which you can organize the molecules of the system, yet achieve the same energy. Um, so Boltzmann's approach is the statistical approach, which enables you to identify what you mean by disorder, which is really the number of ways that you can organize the molecules. And there's the Clausius classical way. And the Clausius classical way is what I'm going to focus on here, but you should always have in mind that um, there is the Boltzmann interpretation in terms of disorder, which is dealt with in another topic. Um, so how do you measure the entropy? Well, you need a system of measurement, and the way of measuring it really follows from its definition, heat in, divided by temperature at which the transfer occurs. And heat in can always be monitored by watching the change in temperature that arises when you inject a certain amount of heat. For that, you need the heat capacity. And you need to make a series of measurements from as low down as you can get in the system, um, and then add together all the changes. So it's an integration problem using your monitoring of the heat transactions at each temperature between T equals zero and the temperature of interest. So there are ways of measuring the entropy calorimetrically. So it's a well-established quantity. Then, of course, um, in the next topic, it, one can apply the same concept to uh, particular physical processes. You know, how do you calculate the entropy change when something vaporizes? How do you calculate the entropy change when something freezes? Uh, so how can you calculate the entropy change for any um, phase transition? And this is really a, now becomes a, a, a glimmer of what's going to happen in the future, where you begin to draw first law concepts into second law calculations, because you can certainly relate um, changes of uh, the, the transfers of heat at constant pressure to changes of enthalpy, and therefore to heat capacities at constant pressure. 
and you can begin to draw those together and build up equations which you can then use to measure the entropy of a, of a system relative to its value at absolute zero, at t equals zero. Of course, then you have to say to yourself, well, what's its value at absolute zero? And the next topic deals with that. It, um, it really builds on um, what became known as the Nernst heat theorem, although there was quite a lot of controversy about whether it was really Nernst who, um, who proposed it. Um, and that changed, evolved into a stronger statement, which is the third law of thermodynamics, which says that you know, the entropy of all, subs all perfectly crystalline substances um, takes the same value at t equals zero, at absolute zero. Um, the third law is a bit funny um, it, because although I said that the laws of thermodynamics each introduce a new property, temperature, energy, entropy, the third law doesn't. It enables you to do calculations, but it doesn't introduce a fourth property of, of, of matter. So some people think, therefore, that the third law is not really a law of thermodynamics, but you know, it's sort of in the canon of, um, of thermodynamics, so we'll treat it as though it was. So all the third law is saying, and it's based observations and its validity is based on um, uh, entropy measurements down as close as you can get to absolute zero, um, simply says that all substances have got the same entropy. And of course it would be sensible, although it's not compelling, to take that value as zero. So the third law simply tells you that you've got to make a choice. Whatever choice you make is valid for all perfect crystals. And the sensible choice is zero. And later on, of course, when you come to apply the Boltzmann statistical definition of entropy and talk about um, disorder and its measurement, and its um, specification, then you can see that zero is um, an appropriate choice because everything is in a uniform array and thermally quiet at t equals zero. The next topic deals, accepts that there is a problem, that the second law is all about the increase in entropy of the universe. Now, for a thermodynamicist, you're a kind of humble person. The universe normally consists of a water bath with a test tube in it. But um, it's a nuisance. Just as it was a nuisance in the first law, having assessed how internal energy changes, um, to um, have to take into account the fact that in the first law case, energy leaked away and you wanted to take it into account. In the second law case, you've got a similar kind of nuisance. In order to apply the second law, you've got to calculate the entropy changes in the entire universe, the system and its surroundings, because the second law is a statement about the universe, not about the system. So what you need to do and you can do this in two steps really, is first of all, discover how you can measure entropy changes in the surroundings. And that's quite straightforward and that's done in the, this particular topic. And then take a major step, which is in the next topic that I'm coming to in the final topic in this particular focus which is to say, I know how to take entropy changes in the surroundings into account automatically. So I can do it with my eyes shut. What I want to do is to find a way of focusing on the system alone, talking about the system itself and its properties, and, but automatically defining those properties so that somehow it reflects what's going on in the surroundings. And that is what 
the Helmholtz energy and the Gibbs energy achieve? Let's talk first of all about the Helmholtz energy. The Helmholtz energy says, suppose I limit myself to constant volume so that the, there's no expansion work going on. I accept that some energy will seep out through these diathermic walls into the surroundings and change the entropy of the surroundings. But I know how to take that into account because whatever heat goes into the surroundings must come from the system. And I know that at, at constant volume, when energy leaves the system at, it leaves the system as heat, then the internal energy changes. So I can express the heat that goes into the surroundings in terms of the change in internal energy of the system. And therefore I can calculate the entropy change of the surroundings in terms of the uh, change in internal energy of the system. Therefore, I can talk about the total entropy change in terms of the properties of the system. The change in entropy of the system plus the extra bit that comes from the change in the internal energy. And that's all the Helmholtz energy is doing. It's just saying a constant volume, we can just focus on the system because anything that escapes from the system goes into the surroundings and changes their entropy. When you come to constant pressure, you've got a very similar argument to make. But now, drawing on what you've done from the first law, you know that, in fact, uh, the change in any heat that escapes from the system, at const any energy that escapes from the system at constant pressure, um, comes from, uh, represents a change in enthalpy of the system. So you can calculate the change in entropy of the surroundings at constant pressure and constant temperature, uh, provided you know the change in enthalpy of the system. And all the Gibbs function does, uh, Gibbs energy does, is to combine the two calculations. So you know everything about the entropy at constant pressure, if you know everything about the Gibbs energy. Um, and no longer do you have to do two calculations. There are differences in sign from um, the Gibbs energy and the, in, and the Helmholtz energy because uh, they're so defined that if the entropy of the universe goes up, the Gibbs energy and the Helmholtz energy go down. It's just a minor sign that's crept in. But now, from now on, you can say, provided I'm interested only in changes at constant volume, a natural change is one that takes place by going to lower Helmholtz energy. And if I'm interested only in um, a system at constant pressure and constant temperature, then I know that um, the direction of spontaneous change is no longer increasing overall entropy. Of course, it still is, but that's hidden. It's now, because of the sign change, going to lower Gibbs energy. So really, we've got now to the part of thermodynamics that is absolutely crucial. We've switched attention from this universal statement about the entropy, and we've turned it into we focused it now on the system and we're talking in terms of the, the Gibbs energy or the Helmholtz energy. And almost always in chemistry, it's because you're dealing mostly with constant pressure. It's the Gibbs energy which moves into the centre of, of, of the theatre of thermodynamics. But never misinterpret the Gibbs energy. The Gibbs energy is simply entropy in disguise and is a way of using the second law in a simple way when you are content to 
impose upon the system constant pressure and constant temperature. Second law is universal, it doesn't have that constraint. You focus attention from the surroundings into the system by accepting that under those conditions life gets easier. Then, in the final culmination of this focus, you bring the second and the first laws together into a single, extraordinarily powerful expression. So you get a statement in terms of Gibbs energy, in terms of entropy, in terms of internal energy and so on, in a single compact formula. And once you've got that little formula, then really the world is your oyster. Because you now, if you do manipulations of that single formula, what you're doing is simultaneously applying the first and the second laws and drawing conclusions about the thermodynamic properties of the system from this in a very powerful way, a way that enables you to relate measurements of one property to another property, measurements that allow you to predict the amount of work that you can get out of the system under different conditions, and understanding why so chemical reactions move towards states of chemical equilibrium. And that really has taken you in this, in this particular focus, it has taken you from introducing an idea about the importance of the quality of energy as measured by the entropy, through the measurement of entropy, through the determination of absolute entropies in terms of specifying what the entropy is at t equals zero, then realizing that you can apply the simple Clausius expression for the entropy change to different physical processes, and then realizing that you can make life so much simpler for yourselves if you focus attention solely upon the system, which you do by introducing the Gibbs and Helmholtz energies. And finally, drawing it all, all together by combining the first and second laws into the fundamental equations of chemical thermodynamics.